Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman and I am absolutely delighted to have Ethan Tufts from Hello Road with me here in the podcast today. Hey Ethan, how's it going? How, pretty good, how are you doing? Thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to chatting today. Yes, and and thank you for doing this. And uh, we're, we're obviously in our little uh, uh, virtual uh, ecam live studio here. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and thank goodness for, for for a technology like this that that makes being able to connect in this manner. And uh, I know yeah. it's awesome. Yeah, it's I good stuff. <laughs> so, Ethan, why don't we do this? Uh, go ahead sure. and just take a moment to uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. All right, so my name is Ethan Tufts. I am a car enthusiast. Uh, I've been a car enthusiast for a very long time. I guess you could say I'm a semi-professional automotive journalist, uh, depending on who you talk to, who you ask. Uh, I run a somewhat successful automotive YouTube channel. I do classic car videos. I do new car reviews, do some travel stories. And uh, like many people in the United States, at an early age, I was indoctrinated into a um, very car-centric uh, car dependent lifestyle and never really considered not owning a car in my life. I've owned 50 cars. I know that's a little ridiculous. I currently own 10 also ridiculous down from 13 a few months ago. Um, but you know, I guess to justify that I bought many of them for my channel so uh, I can, I can sort of justify my car hoarding in a way. <laughs> I spent a lot of time having fun with the cars throughout my life. I used to race Miatas. And then um, I moved on to racing terrible cars. I, uh, I was part of this um, racing series called the 24 Hours of Lemons. And uh, we raced $500 cars. I had the Liam Nissan, which it's a play on words. It's Liam Nissan. Ha ha. Uh, but anyway, you know, I, I spent a lot of time with cars, trying to have fun with cars, organized Canyon Road drives out in the middle of nowhere with friends. And I think somewhere in the back of my head, I've always sort of realized that cars were more the most fun the best when there were a few other cars around when there were a few other pedestrians around it but i never really put much thought into it um and i never really put much thought into car dependency until recently you know thinking about oh maybe there's another way but you know as you've see, maybe seen in my video that's probably the reason why we're talking right now because you saw my that video that um I'm sick of car. I forget exactly what it was titled, but it essentially it said car suck. Yeah. I think it drew the attention of uh, many people who don't like cars. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there were a variety of factors that kind of made me realize that um, cars can be quite terrible, especially in cities and suburbs. They actually ruin, I think cars ruin cities. And that might be weird to hear a car enthusiast say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I do have a visual for our Liam Nis Nissan. Here we go. Oh, yes. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And while this, while this may look like a professional wrap, it's actually just a bunch of laser printed <laughs> images taped to the car. I love it. So, <laughs> That's yeah. great. That, it's a fun series to run in because everybody themes their car. It's like Halloween. <laughs> it's like Burning Man meets car racing. It's right, right. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, so where are you based out of? I live in Los Angeles. I've lived here for 25 years. So um, I live actually in the kind of northwestern corner, Northridge, um, which is one of the more car dependent areas of Los yeah. Angeles. There are a few areas that are, a lot of people don't know this, but there are some walkable areas of Los Angeles. Yes. I happen to not live in one of those areas. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and I think, you know, living here for 25 years, you just, in, in having to drive everywhere generally, you just kind of get used to it. And I think as somebody that was had been into cars, I never really thought, you know, there could be an, another way. Right. You know, I've, you, know you kind of look into uh, public transit. I did that, looked into cycling, you know, 15, 20 years ago when I was trying to get to work. And, you know, you realize that, well, it's going to take three times as long to get where I need to go via bus. Right. Um, so I guess I'll just keep driving. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so you and I uh, have tread on some of the same ground. Um, I'm sure. a, a, originally a Southern Californian. Um, in fact, I'm a fourth okay. generation Los Angelino. Ah. Oh, so, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, so you so know this very well. I know this very well. <laughs> um, and I also have, you know, a family legacy of Los Angeles before cars. Ah, okay. So the family uh, arrived in the late 1800s. And so, uh, and in fact, my great, great 
And my great, great, great grandparents are, are buried in the uh, Rosedale uh, Cemetery, right, uh, sandwiched between uh, Western and Venice and Normandy, right, in the, in, in the central Los Angeles area. And then we mm-hmm. also have USC in common, too. So I, yep. I did my undergraduate at USC, and, and I was there in the, uh, in the 80s, so just, okay. after the, just after the Olympics. So I, I came in, and the, the Olympic rings were still on the buildings there in the mid-80s. So, yeah, um, you still see some Olympic rings on some of the benches at yep. Exposition Park around there for yes. sure. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. And, and, and yeah. the Olympics are coming back. <laughs> yes, there you go. <laughs> so. A lot of people in L.A. I'm not sure about that, if that's a good thing or not, but we'll... Yeah, that's a yeah. discussion for another day. And it's and it's interesting. L.A. has a very, very interesting um, history in the sense that it, it is very car dominated now and and it very, you know, car dependent in many ways. Um, sure. But the true legacy, the true history of, of Los Angeles is one of uh, a tremendous network of, uh, of rail transit, of of streetcar Absolutely. lines in fact it had the most extensive streetcar line um in the nation yeah. uh, when at its peak and uh, in fact my great great grandfather worked on the red line and so oh, okay. it, it, that was like you know just one of the things that you know that was a job you know he was yeah of course he was involved in the uh, the coupling and decoupling of of the, the oh, rail cars so that could be dangerous and, and it was he got injured yeah <laughs> so Yes, as yeah. a matter of fact, uh, but yeah. So the but but the the reality is is uh, you know especially post World War II things really started to you know uh, go crazy on car dependency just nationwide and in the greater Los Angeles area uh, for sure. Um, our our family, which originally started right in the Highland Park area, originally uh-huh. downtown downtown, and then um, uh, right around the turn of the century up in the Highland Park area, and then eventually moving out the the two ten corridor to to Glendora in in that okay. area. As the decades went on, the dependency and the car orientation became more of a thing. And now we are left with something that is quite a mess. However, I will say that we're getting transit in L.A. and it's coming along. It's getting there. It's true. It is coming along. It's a lot better than when I first moved here. I've I've been here 25 years. It's a lot better. Uh, They were just working on the red line when I moved here. They were still there was still construction in Hollywood on that. And uh, yeah, it, it's getting better. And it's there's there's certain pockets that are actually quite, quite decent. They've got some, I'll put it in quotes, air quotes, protected bike lanes, because they're right. protected by K71 plastic bollards and not actual real, right. you know, actual protection. Right. But yeah, there's there is, there is some some things happening. There is also a lot of frustration too, because you know, they have this mobility plan that they I talked about in 2015 and they've implemented 2% of it right. uh, throughout the whole city. Right. And, you know, this is a mobility plan. They're, they're trying to, it's vision zero mobility plan yeah. by 2035. We want zero fatalities. And since then fatalities have gone up. Yeah. They're not following the plan. They just, the city council just recently voted the uh, streets for all is an organization that, that is um, right. yeah, that that's around uh, in LA trying to help, help the situation. I just recently started volunteering with them. And, you know, they, they have this plan. They were trying to get it, really trying to get the city council to just follow this, to agree to vote to follow this plan. And every single city council member voted no. We want to put it on the ballot in 2024. So we're just, we just keep pushing this problem further and further down the road. And, you know, since, and since that vote 90 days ago, literally nothing has happened. So right. um, there's a lot of people that are, that are working to try to make the streets safer, especially for cyclists and pedestrians in Los Angeles. But it's frustrating knowing that, it's just it just keeps getting pushed further and further uh, down the road. Yeah, it's um, interesting too to you know when I I don't know enough these days about the the politics there in in Los Angeles, but um, pushing it to the twenty twenty four election is certainly going to mean that there's going to be more people showing up at the polls for sure. Sure. So maybe it will be a more representative vote um, if that ballot is actually on a on a ballot where uh, certainly a, a, a very, very high percentage more people will be showing sure. up at the polls. So I don't know. Yes. I mean, it, it. I guess the good good news is that it will hopefully bring more awareness to it. Yeah. It's just I think the frustrating thing is that this is a plan that the city has already agreed to do. Yeah. And they're just not doing it. Yeah. So we have to vote on it 
again, I guess. Yeah. Again, again. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. So let's uh, let's let's take a look here. This is your sure. uh, landing page. Let me zoom out here a little bit sure. uh, on this iPad so we can see. So this is this is actually your channel. So this is the Hello Road uh, Ethan Tufts uh, YouTube channel. And sure. uh, yeah, shoots, you're you're right there at a, a, just a, a hair under uh, thirty four thousand subscribers. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, we. And we can just, we get a little bit of a glimpse of the video in question. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that one right there, that's the one that, that I think drew the attention of uh, a lot of people. For so sure. l- let's, let's do this. We're going to, we'll, we'll cue this up and we'll rewind it just a little bit. We'll turn, turn the sound back on and uh, okay. well, let's, let's go ahead and listen to the first, you know, two minutes of this. Hey there, we need to have a chat about the future of this channel, a channel about cars and the fact that I'm starting to hate cars. Today, let's talk about it. Solid opening there. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So I'm on one of my favorite canyon roads and I thought this would be a good place to talk about what's going on with me, what's going on with this channel, mainly because it's away from the city, it's away from the suburbs both places where I really hate driving. And roads like this are usually fun, mainly because there's no one else around. Okay, so before we get into why I'm starting to uh, hate cars, let's take a quick look back in time. When I was a kid, I spent most of my time surrounded by Matchbox cars. I could also be found with my head buried in a sketchbook drawing cars. I had my own (laughs) line of cars, I had my own brands. It was pretty silly. I've owned almost 50 cars in my life. I've restored cars, I've ruined cars, I've raced cars, I've done fun things in cars, I've done dumb things in cars. So yeah, automobiles have been a big part of my life and that's (laughs) one of the reasons why I started this channel. And I've been making videos on this channel for five years, which is nuts. It's truly been a life-changing experience with the people that I've met, the places that I've traveled to, and all the unique cars I've gotten to drive. But even with all those positives, I don't really think it's working. It's not really working for me personally or creatively. It's not really working for my mental health. And it's certainly not working for the greater good. So that's where we come to the part where I said that I'm starting to hate cars. I'm a car enthusiast that's falling out of love with the automobile, or at least certain aspects of cars. And this changing perspective has made me less excited to create certain types of videos. It's even made me just consider quitting and shutting down the whole channel. Yep. So let's dig into it. (laughs) So, yes, I love it. And everybody, obviously, the the link will be uh, provided in the video description uh, below. You need to go watch the entire video. Um, Let's reflect a little bit on that, that opening. And then we'll we'll fast forward to the end and, and get a little bit of of, you know, sort of that parting thought. But bring us up to speed you you were pretty far along by the time you decided to press record and record this video so two reflections is uh you know what bring us up to speed from you know the early stages of of like having that awareness of starting to become disillusioned with things and maybe it was because you had 13 plus cars in your yard yeah that might be part of it <laughs> but you know bring us up yeah. to speed of of you know what was the straw that broke the camel, camel's back that you know made you press record on this one sure i mean i've always known that there are environmental problems with cars that's always been something that i've i've struggled with um but never really thought seriously about car dependency until a few months ago. Uh, And I think there's a whole bunch of things that all kind of came together at once, which I think, you know, we could we could talk about each each thing, you know, it it wasn't any one thing, it was a whole bunch of things that sort of came to came together. And, And like you said, yeah, maybe having 13 cars and the expense of having 13 cars was not a great idea. In, in, in defense of that, they were mainly for the channel. Um, but uh, yeah, car hoarding, not good. I think the first thing that really started to send me down this path of thinking about car dependency and, and the ways that cars can be awful is based on me having access to a lot of new cars. I review a lot of new cars and I started to notice huge blind spots, both figuratively, figuratively and literally in car design. So basically you've got automakers that are killing off cars, small cars, in favor of larger vehicles 
and cars have grown substantially in the last 20, 30 years. Um, if you've seen any of my other videos, you'll know that I'm a big fan of the cars from the 1980s and the 1990s. It's just the era that I grew up in. I have a lot of nostalgia for them and it's just the cars that I like. So I started to compare cars that I own, older cars to brand new vehicles. So there you go, there's a picture right there. On the right is my 1992 F-150. On the left is a 2022 Ford F-150. Now, granted, the one on the left is four-wheel drive. The one on the right is two-wheel drive. So there's a little bit of difference there. But just in general, the difference in size is is pretty it's pretty mind-blowing how much cars and vehicles have grown. The, the uh, 2022 F-150 is seven inches taller than mine. The hood is quite a bit taller. Even the bed in the back. I'm six foot three. I'm not a short person. The bed comes up nearly, the top of the bed comes up nearly to my chin. So we're making these vehicles larger, but they're not actually even um, more useful. And that's actually more difficult to put vehicle uh, stuff in the back of the vehicle. And yeah, there's my daughter walking around our neighborhood and, and some of the vehicles that we encounter <laughs> on a daily basis. No, but um, Ethan, I, I can't imagine. What's the problem here? Um, you know, I don't see any problem there. <laughs> it's just freedom freedom of choice you can drive whatever you want you know a lot of people say well your kids shouldn't be in the street uh kids you should teach your kid to not walk in front of cars that kind of thing but yeah if even if you yeah <laughs> there's a few issues here um so yeah you know there's there's also my toyota tacoma which is a much smaller vehicle even a new toyota tacoma is much bigger than my 20 year old toyota tacoma that i had and you know it's kind of funny if you look at the picture of, of that one the hood is much higher New vehicles often have more um, more space inside. Uh, there's there's definitely more. They're, they're heavier because yes, airbags can be heavy. The safety equipment can be heavy. But the, I think the funny thing to compare about these particular cars, the one on the left looks more capable, looks more tough. But guess which one actually has more ground clearance? The old one. Right. You know. So like as in terms of capabilities and, and having a four wheel drive vehicle do what you want it to do, the old one is going to perform better. <laughs> Wow. Um, yeah. so there's, there's things like that. Yeah. And you know, part of the reason why safety gear is, is heavy, but you know, I, it does appear as though a lot of the reasons why vehicles are getting larger is they, they want them to look, it's all marketing. They want it. It's aesthetics. They want them to look more aggressive. They want customers want to tower over other, other vehicles. And, you know, obviously, yeah, as this, this image shows, especially SUVs and pickup trucks, the blind spots are incredibly huge, much bigger than the small vehicles. Yeah. And I, I think there's a question we need to ask is why are manufacturers killing off these small cars? It wasn't that long ago that you could buy a small little hatchback and get, you know, get to and from work with no big deal. You could blind, no, no, uh, weren't that many blind spots, that kind of thing. Yeah. Here's my friend, Paul's Daihatsu charade. You know, it's just a cute little adorable car. I, I will say, yes, probably not very safe by today's standards safe for the occupants. But right. I think one of the reasons why automakers are pushing larger and larger vehicles is because they're much more profitable, you know, and it's not just automakers, car dealers too. a car dealer is going to try to push you into a larger vehicle because they're going to make a lot more having dealt with a lot of auto manufacturers on reviews and that kind of thing and looking at their press releases and, and reading their their specs and, and, that, and their spec sheets and all that on their vehicles. There's almost zero attention paid towards pedestrian or cyclist safety. It's all about, it's all about the marketing of the vehicles, all about the sexiness. And you can see that in the new types of vehicles that are being proposed. You got the Hummer EV, which is 9,000 pounds. It's almost four times the weight as one of my 1980 sedans. The battery itself weighs as much as like a Honda Civic, right? You know, and these things are quick. They have tons of horsepower. You got president Biden touting these as being, you know, the, uh, the future of vehicles, but you know, uh, the Hummer EV is absolutely going to kill people. I, I guarantee people are going to die because, because this vehicle has the capabilities and the size and the weight that it does. Yeah. Um, so I, I so want to pop over to Twitter here real quick because you literally just 18 hours ago <laughs> put this out. <laughs> we're, we're actually recording this on, on, uh, September 28th. And so, uh, it, it's a, a good portion of, of, what I've been following you is is out here on Twitter and seeing that you're mm -hmm. you're, you're pushing a lot of this stuff out, and uh, yeah, it's it's great. We used to be a proper country, <laughs> I tell you, <laughs> a proper country. Bring back the small, efficient, funky, adorable hatchbacks. Oh yeah, 
Yeah, we, I know. It I is think adorable. we had one of these, you know, adorable hatchbacks. It was a Honda. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, the thing is, that obviously, uh, with the shift towards larger and larger vehicles, people don't feel as safe in a car like that anymore. It's sort of this arms race towards larger and larger vehicles. Yeah. And I think that the troubling thing is that even smaller SUVs, which people are moving to, things like, you know, the Toyota RAV4, Toyota Venza, Honda CRV, that kind of thing, you know, they they have worse visibility than the than cars of the past. You know, yeah. they have higher belt lines. The blind, there's bigger blind spots, and a lot of these family cars have as much horsepower as sports cars from the '80s. So, right. you know, the the marketing about about them is is how is, is the capabilities and the and the specs um and the perceived and the safety for the occupants but they're far less safe for anybody outside the car right um and you know i guess that also leads me to the other thing that i that i uh keep seeing in vehicles is the distracting technology that is being added to cars you know you've got more and more screens you've got too many screens you've got poorly implemented or poorly designed screens you know, that's one of the reasons why I like driving cars from the 80s and 90s. They're smaller, they're easier to see out of, and they don't have distracting technology. You actually have to pay attention. You're, you're, you know, part of it is, you know, being in an older car, there's less safety gear. You sort of have to, I, I mentioned this in my video, like if everybody was forced to drive 80s ship boxes every single day, they'd probably be safer. They probably would, would be more careful behind the wheel, but you have all these screens now that is distracting people. Uh, I read this study about this. They compared this old, <clears throat> excuse me, like 17 year old Volvo that had physical controls for the radio and the stereo um, and the AC. And they compared it to new cars with screens. And the uh, with the Volvo, it took about 10 seconds to complete these four tasks they were asking the testers to do. And the worst car had a huge screen, very mounted very low to the ground. So you have to take your eyes down, um, not looking at the uh, out the window. And, it, and to complete those four tasks, it took four times the amount, sorry, yeah, 40 seconds instead of 10 seconds, and it traveled four times the distance. So you can see how there's some vehicles, I think the new Rivian electric truck, you need to go into the menu to adjust your vents. You mm. know, it's, it's ridiculous. And part wow. of this is, you know, cost savings. Yeah, the, if the manufacturer does not have to create custom switches, switch gear and buttons and that kind of thing, it's way cheaper to just add a screen. And it's marketing. If you look at this picture right here, you've got of this uh, Mercedes EQS. It looks awesome. I mean, the, the graphics are amazing. It's really good eye candy. It looks luxurious. Um, but it's because I think we're seeing more and more technology like this because studies have shown that because of traffic, because of you know the, the stress that people have behind the wheel in cities and suburbs, a lot of people don't actually like driving they'd much rather be doing something else oh this is one of the worst this this v volkswagen id4 that you picked up mm -hmm. that um that you put right here like this is this is one of the most distracting poorly designed systems that i've seen and it actually was quite buggy like buttons don't do what you think they're supposed to do there's capacitive touch everywhere and like yeah there's bugs it's just it's it's bad <laughs> but you know i think if if <laughs> Not only is it a lot of these implemented poorly, they're yeah they're distracted, distracting. Yeah. But I think I think that the reason why auto manufacturers are adding stuff like this is it's eye candy. It, it it takes people's minds away from the fact that they're doing something that they'd rather not be doing. They'd rather be on Twitter. They'd rather be looking at cat videos on TikTok. That's why you see so many people on their phones in traffic. You know, I see all the time. You've got people looking at their their phones um, at stoplights or you know when they think they can get away with it. It's because there are so many people in car dependent places that don't want to drive. They have to, but they don't, they haven't really, you know, maybe they haven't ever thought that there was another way that was possible. They just want to get to their destination conveniently and efficiently. And another way, another convenient and efficient way has not been presented to them. So they'll, they'll drive their car distracted Yeah, yeah. because they don't want to be there. And automakers know this too. Automakers yeah. know this. That's why they're yeah. adding this stuff because they know that driving sucks sometimes. Yeah. Well, and it, there's so. a, there's a huge disconnect too between the reality of of what it's like to drive and what we're what we're shown. You know what what what's out there in terms of of marketing. And uh, so, yes. <laughs> so this is a this is a, a an ad that you sent through and. Uh, there's no sound to it, so we can just kind of talk right over it. And, and sure. but 
I, mean, I, I compiled I compiled about 30 car ads. Yeah. All the same. You yeah. know, this is this is this is not just one ad. This is about 30 ads where you couldn't even tell which car company is because it all they all show the same thing. Right. They, yeah. they all show the narrative of freedom, you know. Uh, wide open roads, no traffic. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. I, and then, yeah. you know, a lot of, like this one right here, they're showing illegal things, you know, knowing that buyers right. do want to do some of those things. Um, they right. do want to drive faster than everybody else and get around everybody. But, you know, these these things are pushing the idea of cars as freedom. But in reality, it, it, it rarely looks like this. You know, maybe in a rural area. Yeah, you'll have a you'll have a, a great wide open road. Sure, sure. Um, but, you know, it sort of reminds me of like the Big Mac analogy where, you know, the commercials of a Big Mac, they look so beautiful. It looks like the best sandwich in the world. And then they go to McDonald's and it it literally barely looks like food. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's the same thing with these car commercials. I mean, I understand that there's a practical element to filming a car commercial with no other cars around. That's probably there's probably right. a reason why they don't want to have to deal with traffic when they're filming a commercial. But right. it's, it's all about, you know you know, sh giving this idea that this, this car is going to solve all your problems. Like, yeah. well, like all, mar all marketing does. Right. You know? Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. and it's also it, what you were saying earlier reminds me too of some of the, the framing that Peter Norton has in his uh, most recent book, uh, Autonorama. And he talks about how the auto manufacturers were, um, were really, working on being able to create vehicles that um, every year, you know, they're creating something that, you know, uh, something's new, something's blingy, mm -hmm. something's this, because it, it they didn't want to just like sell a person a car and have that person own that car until it's obsolescence. They wanted to be able to, you know, continue with the, the whiz bangs and the blings and the, this, and, and this type of thing, uh, new special color this year, because they yeah. really wanted to have people coming back to that showroom for the next greatest thing. And so I could totally see yeah. like with the, the screens and, and all of the, the stuff that's, that's going into them, that this is, this is about new car sales and keeping that flywheel of people coming back to the showroom for that. Sure. And right now it's, it's, it's the screens, it's that technology, it's the promise of self-driving cars, it's the promise of, you know, autonomous vehicles, uh, the promise of, of more efficient electric cars, but I think it's sort of important to think about what is the real purpose of self-driving technology? What is the real impetus behind, you know, automakers shifting to electric? I don't think there's this grand plan to make the world a better place. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, autonomous cars, self-driving cars, electric cars, they're all here to help the car industry. They're not here to save the planet. They're not here to save lives. They're not here to make, to, to reduce traffic. They're here to help the car industry. And yeah, maybe there's some added benefit of, of uh, fewer, uh, less, you know, CO2 emissions being expelled by some of these vehicles. But I think that's a lot of the things what you're talking about, you know, the new, the new color, that kind of thing. I think that's where the, the, the promise of self-driving tech is, is that again, automakers know that a lot of people don't like driving. They don't want to be there, but they need, they they need that cash money. They need to find a way to keep selling cars to people that that uh you know and and cre keep keep the system where people need them. Yeah, yeah. And and you know it's it's interesting too because like you know talking about like the the uh, motivations of car companies. Yeah, there's obviously some people that work at car companies that really care about safety, but that's not really seen. That's not really marketed. That's not really. You don't, you don't really see that those types of uh, discussions when when cars are marketed and yeah there's some there's some good technologies coming out like auto braking that helps uh, you know protect pedestrians um, but you know Europe's far ahead of us on this and you know if you look back at the history of the the pushback of the auto industry on safety tech like there was so much pushback on seat belts you know I don't think car manufacturers are going to be adding any technology to cars that protect pedestrians and cyclists unless they're absolutely forced to. Yeah. 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 Um, the, uh, I, I have to pull up this, this photo here. You, sure. you, you have this, uh, this, <clears throat> this one labeled in car enthusiasts. So, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
I mean, everybody's experienced, everybody that's been in the car has experienced this. And yeah. some people experience this far more uh, than others do. Yeah. You know, this came from a Streets blog article about how you know, there's studies that show that there's just a lot of people that don't like driving. Yeah. Um, and if presented with a, a convenient and a safe and efficient alternative, a lot of people would would switch yeah you know and you know that i think there's there's the there's that side of it where it's like you know people are just going to do whatever's more convenient and and so you just mentioned uh streets blog and so uh you had a, a chance to be uh, interviewed and and have an article written up by uh, my good friend kia wilson mm-hmm. and so uh you, you ended up on uh, streets blog usa and uh <laughs> here it is <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I, I, I would, as a, you know, as somebody that's hasn't really been in this world, I, yeah. you know, every single, every single one of your guests is going to know way more about street design and urbanism and all that kind of, than I am. I'm like completely new to all this, but it, so I was like, oh, I've never heard of streets blog before. This is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's so cool. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, I've been, uh, steeped in this for the last 15 years, um, mm-hmm. in, in the, the, the realm of uh, disease prevention, health promotion, and trying to build communities that encourage healthy, active behavior uh, for the past sure. 30 some odd years. And so, uh, okay. you know, that's, and that's exactly what I studied at USC was exercise physiology okay. and uh, uh, immediately went on and did my master's in, in public health and, and kinesiology at the University of Michigan. But it's, it's so cool when I see, you know, this type of a thing where uh, you you found your way to this and um, and and then you were just like holy moly what did I tap into? I mean, because <laughs> you didn't you didn't anticipate getting this type of attention from us, but we're like cool. We've got this car enthusiast that has like realized something of his own volition and created this content and uh, and yeah, I watched the the Twitter storm and. Uh, of of <laughs> folks in the the bike and pedestrian and safer streets advocacy and urbanism and they they kind of like guys you got to check out this video that Ethan did this is really really cool so talk a little bit about that you know sort of in the wake of all this all that attention that you had um, you know I think part of it was I I think I've sort of always realized that that there's a difference between somebody that's in a car, like a person in a car versus a car enthusiast, a person that's just in a car just needs to get where they want to go. Car enthusiasts. Oh, you mean this person? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're trying to get where they want to go. I think a lot, I think a car enthusiast is somebody that, you know, actually really appreciates car de- design. They, they may appreciate the, the technology. Uh, they may really like driving in situations where that are, are very unlike that photo. So I think, but I think that sometimes that those people can be the same, you know, like I have to get my kid to school. I have right. to, uh, most of my, well, I try to make most of my car activities fun. Most of them are not, but I, I, I think I found that, uh, there are a lot of car enthusiasts that are very open to, to these types of ideas because, you know, they want to have fun driving. They want to enjoy cars. And, you know, if you have, you know, if they're thinking about all the, f- the fatalities every single year, if they think about all the traffic that they have to deal with, they're probably going to want more, more and more people to switch to other modes of transport. That way, when they do drive a car, it's more pleasant. And I think there's a lot of car enthusiasts that I, you know, after making this video, a lot of car enthusiasts reached out to me and they, they said, oh yeah, this, this resonates with me. I never really thought about it before. But it's it's important to me because they you know nobody wants to have people die from car from you know autom- automotive crashes, and you know I think it's also uh, something that that car enthusiasts and you know people that are advocates for safe streets, we should be working together. You know we should be uh, it's in it's in car enthusiasts' best interest to care about these things, and I I think that there are, are a lot of car, car enthusiasts that do. On the other side of the coin, there are, you know, I have a lot of car, potential car sh- buyers and car shoppers that visit my channel. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to try to, for me, to think about um, how can I talk to them in a way that isn't uh, alienating. Right. You know, I, I, what, you know, I think it, what you heard on, on that little clip of my video, you know, was trying to figure out, should I just quit and close the channel down? Because I feel like I'm... I'm doing something that's making the world worse. 
You know, yeah. I'm not making the world better by promoting these things that are getting increasingly larger and more dangerous for pedestrians and cyclists. But then I started to really kind of try to try to work out if there's a way to uh, to talk to potential car shoppers and see if there is, you know, people who are actively looking at, to buy a car. These are people that are like within the next few months might be might be buying something. Can I convince them to not buy a car, or maybe to buy, or, or at the very least, consider something smaller and more efficient and more safe for people outside the car? And you know, I haven't really quite figured out how to do that because um, it's also something that you're not used to seeing. Like, people aren't used to seeing this type of conversation in the automotive world. You know, th- if you look at like how most automotive journalists talk about new cars, it's all about the features. It's all about the sexiness. It's all about like creating this, building this story of like how, how fun this car is going to be um, or how useful it's going to be for you. There's very, very few automotive journalists that are actually talking about the safety of people outside the car. So there might be a way, I haven't, like I said, I haven't quite figured it out yet, but there might be a way to try to incorporate that into my messaging. I did a little bit of that in my recent Mazda MX-5 Miata video. And one of the reasons why I love that vehicle so much is because it's so small. It is because the visibility is so good. It is because it is so lightweight, you know, if, uh, and, and there's, there might be a way to, to sort of standardize talking about blind spots. I know that there are some organizations that are doing this, you know, if there's, there are ways to, to measure blind spots of vehicles and perhaps in my videos, I can do that for all of the new vehicles that I'm reviewing. So that way, for instance, you could see that maybe a, a Honda fit has a, a blind spot of zero children. What if I measured it in children? How many children right. could fit in these blind spots? Maybe a Dodge Ram 2500 has a 200 child blind spot. Right. And I think if people heard about it in those terms, and and thought about oh i never really i think a lot of car buyers don't even consider that yeah. they just think of the features of like okay will it fit my family you know maybe what's the gas mileage does it have uh the appropriate safety features does it have apple carplay or android auto that's the kind of things people are thinking about but if they really kind of considered oh there's a very high risk of me running over my child in my own driveway if i have this vehicle maybe i'll consider something that's easier to see out of yeah yeah. I, um, uh, I rarely get excited about new cars. <laughs> so I, I just don't, I mean, I'm, sure. I'm beyond yeah. that at the, at this point in time. <laughs> um, I, I haven't personally owned a car in quite some time, uh, since okay. we made the move from Hawaii here to, to Austin, Texas. And, mm-hmm. uh, and we've got one car at the household here and that we share. And honestly, we hardly ever drive it. Um, mm-hmm. it's usually reserved for long road trips. Because we're able sure. to meet our daily needs by, uh, you know, walking and biking. Uh, and, you know, uh, when Laura needs to commute, she can jump on her bike and go to, go to the office. And I'm mm-hmm. producing these podcasts and these videos uh, here from the, the home office in our little uh, bungalow here. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's just not a thing. But I was walking sure. this morning and saw uh, one of the neighbors uh, had a had his uh, new Mini Cooper plugged in, and I'd, I'm not sure if it's a hybrid or if it's a full-on uh, electric uh, vehicle, but it was pretty decent size. I mean, it was it, it was very small, decent, mm-hmm. meaning it wasn't too big. And sure. I'm like, again, I hardly ever get excited about any new cars, but it's almost shocking when you actually see a reasonably sized vehicle that, you know, is, you know, sort of similar to that little hatchback that we were looking at, you know, sure. it's not just this monster behemoth. Yeah. Talk with me a little bit about the fact that this is an artifact of what the manufacturers can get away with, because in Europe, where there's standards of being able to hold the manufacturers accountable to the damage that they might cause to people outside the motor vehicles, um, the manufacturers are creating different vehicles for those markets. And so sure. it's not like we're, you know, we have to just accept what we're getting here. And, you know, because they don't know how to make a smaller vehicle anymore. <laughs> an sure. F-150 is going to be the size of an F-150, uh, which is a monster size now compared, as we saw in that, that comparison photo, to what used to be there in 1992. Sure. Um, what gives? You know, this is something that I'm, I'm not incredibly 
really well versed at, well versed in you know there are um, obviously Europe has some pretty strict standards for um, pedestrian safety uh, honestly I don't really know what types of uh, regulations we have here I know there's certain things in terms of you know like headlights and that kind of thing uh, but I, I think that you know with the with the way that these larger cars are being marketed i i'm not sure if there's going to be any way to to help this uh, other than regulating some of it right or to really try to convince people that uh well you know what i'm trying to do trying to convince people that yeah maybe maybe smaller cars are better you know maybe there's a better um, I'm laughing because one of yeah. the things that popped in my head is they're just going to throw technology at us. And I know that they already are. They're, they're like, oh, rather than rather than resize these vehicles to a reasonable size, let's throw cameras. And so we'll have a camera, you know, being able to detect if there's somebody behind or somebody uh, in front of us. Sure. Well, and that's yeah. the thing. You, the, I have a photo in that folder on the, the car size of the Cadillac Escalade, you know, mm -hmm. it's one of the largest, uh, lar like three row SUVs you can buy. And yeah, you, yeah, there's a front camera there. Right. Um, yeah. and it's, you know, it's, it's a very, has a very gigantic hood, yeah. very difficult to see out the front and you, you kind of need it. Yeah. You kind of need that front camera. If you're, if you're, uh, if you really want to be careful about not hitting people. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the, you know, like I said, I'm not too, I'm not too well versed on the on the uh, uh, the regulation side of things but you know i i think one of the things that the result of these larger vehicles the result of of uh more and more of these vehicles being on the road is one of the one of the things that got me so fired up about you know having to change was just the amount of fatalities yeah that that we see every single year due to drivers and yeah i i I don't. I don't know the way. To, I don't know the way to solve it to make vehicles smaller. But I. I do know that there. There's just. I think if more and more people really started to understand the, the hugeness of this problem and the fact that you know we've had forty three thousand deaths due to cars in twenty twenty one. That's that's the most since two thousand five. Almost eight thousand pedestrian deaths. That's the most in forty years. Right. You know we've got. Pretty sure we have a higher death rate than most other developed nations and even per miles driven where we have a higher death rate than most of europe and you know like i said with these cars getting larger and larger i don't see it getting any better and well and, and from and, a, and, and from a car enthusiast perspective too i mean we, it's also not an experience that we really enjoy and in fact, one of one of the greatest statistics that I that that I glom onto with how well the Dutch are, are doing with their mobility networks in general is that there's a high level of satisfaction from the driver's perspective. They're, they have a good experience yes. because people have options. And so the people who are left to drive are those who either really, really want to drive or really, really need to drive, but people who, you know, would really rather not drive, it's a pain in the butt, they have options. Sure, exactly. Yeah. And that's, you know, that me being in Los Angeles and having, you know, being in one of the more car dependent places of Los Angeles, I, I think that's, that's just it. If I had convenient options that would get me to where I needed to go as quickly as a car, you know, th I think that's the thing is like, sometimes, depending on where you're going, the car is not going to be faster. But most of the time, even if there is traffic, even if there is traffic, it's going to be faster because we have so few dedicated bus lanes here. Right. We have so few protected bike lanes, that kind of thing. So, you know, the buses are just getting in the same, stuck in the same traffic as cars. And, you know, it's just, it's just, I think the thing that's so silly about it is it doesn't take that many people to shift to other modes to increase traffic. Right. If, you know, and you've probably talked about this with other guests, but it's just, you know, I haven't really thought about it until recently. It's like, you know, we have everybody driving around in their own air conditioned living rooms. And it turns out it's hard to fit a lot of living rooms on all of the streets that we have in Los Angeles. They're just cars are just geometrically inefficient yeah, yeah. ways of transporting people. And like you said, I think if well, there's a lot of people we talked about, there's a lot of people that don't like driving, even if they maybe don't know it yet. Yeah. And if they had another option, they would probably take it. 
if it meant that they could do other things, they could read, they could be on their phone, they could, you know, get some work done, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and it, I, I, it doesn't take, like I said, it doesn't take that many people to shift to other modes to reduce traffic, yeah. at least from the studies that I've seen. Well, let's listen to Ethan of the past um, here, uh, just just a, a short uh, one minute clip. So what does this mean about the types of videos I'll be making moving forward? I'm tempted to just stop making videos with new cars altogether, but I think there might be a benefit to me continuing it, but taking a much more critical look at the environmental cost, pedestrian safety aspects, efficiency, size, weight, visibility, distracting technology, and the true cost of car ownership. I live in one of the most car dominated, traffic prone places on the planet. And quite honestly, I'm sick of having to use cars for things that suck, in situations that suck. I'd love to get to a point where I only use cars for fun activities. Road trips, canyon road drives, off-roading, driving on racetracks, and decorating cars based on stupid puns. I'd like to try to avoid using cars for anything else. I know that isn't incredibly realistic, but I'd like to slowly move towards that if I can. It might mean having to move to a more walkable neighborhood. It might mean getting involved with local organizations that are helping to make streets safer. Okay, so in the end, I guess I've learned that I don't actually hate cars, but I do really hate car dependency. And I've learned that you can enjoy cars, but still want to do something about unsafe streets, traffic and pedestrian fatalities. As car enthusiasts, it's actually in our best interest to care about these things and want to do something about them. It doesn't have to be an either or situation. I love it. And that's exactly <laughs> what you just said too. Yeah. 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 It, it's a, uh, you know, I, again, I, I, I kind of went back and forth with this. I really tried to figure out, do I actually really hate cars? No, I just hate having to use cars for everything. Car I want them dependency. to just be fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, car dependency. Just, uh, the, yeah. The, the fact that we have the system where in order to participate in society, you know, to get to work, to get to your doctor, to get, you know, to get your kid to school, you know, you we, we were forced to drive. Yeah, yeah. Now, you, the uh, uh, a follow-up video to uh, that particular video, um, you fulfilled your promise of <laughs> wanting to talk about uh, the true cost of cars. And so walk us through, you, you've got a, a series of uh, slides that you sent my way here in, in various sure. graphics. Um, so take it away. Sure. Well, you know, I think, like, like I said, there's a lot of people don't feel like there's an alternative to driving. And people spending, you know, 80, 90, $100,000 on a brand new luxury pickup truck, a lot of people just don't see how financially ridiculous that is. They just, they, they sort of internally know they, they need a car. They might as well make it something that they're going to enjoy. <laughs> so this right here, this is AAA's, this is a, this, you know, AAA is an organization that is around to promote driving. And even they're saying that it's costing almost 11 grand a year for the average American to operate a car. And it's probably a little bit higher now, you know, if you factor in the gas prices of the last year or so. So if you look at a lifetime of, I, I just picked uh, 50 years, it, you might actually be driving longer than that, depending on how long a person lives, but 50 years of driving about, you know, 11 grand a year, we're at, you know, $536,000 you've spent in a lifetime of driving. Yeah. And, you know, if you look at the opportunity cost of that, of like, okay, what if I wasn't driving? What if I instead invested that money you know, depending on how you calculate it, you could have $7 million in opportunity cost over 5 million years, over, sorry, 5 million years, over 50 years, right. um, you know, to, to uh, own a car throughout your life. So there's, I think a lot of people don't think about, I, I got to imagine most people don't really think about it. They just think of it as a given, but it's a huge financial burden. You know, the so average. That's quite the sunk cost. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, the parking. Um, if, Exactly. Uh, if you go to the slide, that is, um, I think there's average car payment or car price, not that one. Uh, yeah, car so payment. right here. So yeah, um, right now, with, I, this is nuts that the average car payment in the US for a new car is $712 yeah. a month. You know, that's almost, again, it's almost $9,000 a year. That's So if you bought a new car, you're just at 9000 a, uh, a year just for the car. That just doesn't for include the car. Right. fuel, insurance you know, all these, all those other associated costs. Yeah. The average, average new car price today 
is forty eight thousand dollars less than a decade ago. It was thirty. Yeah. Um, you know, so if you think, okay, forty eight thousand dollar car price, if you have good credit, you're probably spending um, thirteen grand in interest yeah. over the lifetime of the loan. If you have bad credit, the total loan might cost you almost ninety grand for this average car. Right. Right. And by by that point, you know, you've got ninety thousand miles on this car. You've spent you know, $90,000 on. So yeah, there's, and, and I guess the other, the other thing that's nuts to me is, yeah. is, and Oh, and by the way, is, you do have a graphic on that. Okay. Here, there here it, it is. is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and that's, um, yeah, that's the, uh, bad interest rate. So 20% interest, that's it's the average nuts. for if you have bad credit, yeah. the, the good yeah. credit average is about 8%, which is still seems pretty high. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, Although those rates think, are going up. Yeah. Yeah. And, I think the thing that's nuts, and this is coming from somebody that owns 13 vehicles, uh, is that in my percentage is going to be probably higher than the average, but average American household in 2020, when driving was low yeah. compared to other years, it was 16% of your expenses. Yeah. So that's the second largest expense after housing. Uh, it's more than we spend on food, which yeah. is just insane to me yeah yeah so this yeah. is if you own a new car this is you could be spending you know 14 grand a year on a car yeah um and, and i think the other thing that's that's crazy is that you know 16 percent is the average household uh expenditure you know for lower household lower income households it can be as high as 29 percent right so it really shows you that car ownership is like a regressive tax you know it's it's not going to cost unless i mean unless you can find a way to buy a cheap car and keep it running on the cheap yeah uh, which is often hard to do well and you know, and correct me if i'm wrong but my impression is that that's kind of what your game has been <laughs> yes yeah i well and, and i tend to buy cars that are a little bit older than the average average person might right. buy yeah and they're they've been a huge a huge expense so i i own a 1980 <laughs> 1986 Porsche 944 Turbo, which is a lovely car. It's it's fun to drive. Yeah, I love that's the this design. one right here. Yeah, it's that one right there. It's got yeah. pop up headlights. It's just epitome yeah. of 1980s yeah. 80s car design. I I listen to like 80s music when I drive it because it just puts me in that like nostalgic <laughs> mind. Right, right. Um, but that car, I I am about to create a video with it to calculate the cost per mile, and I I don't even want to admit this. <laughs> but it, it, I spent so much money on that car. The cost per mile is five dollars. It cost right. me five dollars a mile, right, to drive to drive to own and operate. That's that not car. per gallon, folks. That's no per mile. five dollars a mile. <laughs> and obviously, this is a this is a extreme case. Right. Hopefully, if you bought a used Toyota Corolla, it's not going to do that to you. Right. Um, but still, you know, if the the amount people spend on cars is pretty nuts, and and I think it's nuts. I think it's crazy because the average car sits, it's parked right. for 96% of the time. So you're putting all this money towards something that just sits in your garage or sits in a parking spot. Um, and, and, uh, I, I, I wish, you know, I wish I had thought about that a little bit more <laughs> before, uh, owning 50 cars throughout my life. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, again, I, I will justify it saying that I do try to, I do try to keep my car experiences fun. But but uh, it is a lot of money for for something that's a hobby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, it as you mentioned, you know, it's a little bit of a business expense in, in terms of yes, you know for exactly. the channel and and all of yeah. that. Uh, I mean, this this price tag here on an annualized basis, this is like buying the absolute best e cargo bike with suspension. Uh, and still have a, a couple grand left over uh, every year, so you could have exactly. a brand new e cargo bike pimped out every year. So, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. That's a good way to look at it for sure. Yeah. Because yeah. people, because you get, honestly, because that's one of the the, the challenges of uh, the electric assist uh, technology that's coming out with the bikes. Um, they have really wonderful, uh, especially if you have a Bosch motor and, uh, and, and battery system, uh, they don't mm -hmm. come cheap. You know, yeah. these are, these are pricey, uh, you know, uh, bicycles from a bicycle perspective, but then when you put it into that context, it is cheap. Yeah, <laughs> it is very <laughs> it's, cheap. It's dirt cheap. <laughs> well, and, and I think I see a lot of those tweets on, on Twitter about how, you know, 
people people talk about the cost of these e-cargo bikes and they they sort of feel like this is sort of this elitist thing where you're spending fourteen thousand dollars on a bike because i think a lot of people think of a bike as recreation they think of a bike as something that you had as a kid and you kind of grow your way out of it but they're not thinking of that the same way as spending you know ninety thousand dollars on a f-250 king ranch edition you know yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah. Um, uh, what's interesting, uh, too, about Los Angeles, um, up until um, my grandmother passed away a couple of years ago, um, I would fly into uh, into LAX with my little folding bike. And from from the airport there, I'd you know jump on the little shuttle bus over to catch the uh, the, the rail system. And uh-huh. I can't remember the name of it. I guess it's the green line. I'd get on the green line and then uh, get off to the transfer to, you know, get on the, 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 the line that, you know, heads uh, downtown and, you know, going right past USC and campus uh-huh. and uh, then jump off. And, and in fact, I frequently I just jump off at USC to um, to to jump on the bike and tootle around a little bit to see how uh, campus is, is transforming because it's becoming mm-hmm more and more walkable bikeable it's it's amazing to see how that campus has transformed since the 1980s but then you know i'd ride around downtown a little bit and then head on downtown to the uh, the station uh, where i jump on the gold line and then head on out through pasadena and then head as far uh, east as i could get which at the time was uh, i think i had to get off at azusa and mm-hmm. then from Azusa, I could then ride the bike the rest of the way to Glendora to, to, to get to my yep. grandmother's house. And, gee, what did I just do? I just went across the entire basin of Los Angeles. And, sure. uh, and I didn't have to get into an automobile the entire time. It is possible. Mm-hmm. Um, it is possible. It, but it, it's, it's certainly not what I would call all ages and abilities and really, truly you know, welcoming to somebody who doesn't know the transit system, doesn't know, uh, you know, how to get on to some of the quieter streets. Uh, so you're avoiding some of the bigger streets and, you know, and quite frankly, I know my way around LA on a bike. Mm-hmm. And so it, sure. it, uh, it's something that like, I know some of the beautiful old neighborhoods, uh, that you can take, you know, all the way from Hollywood down to the downtown area. I mean, yeah. There's some amazing, you know, neighborhoods that, that can be done. And those are the quiet residential streets that are sort of like this invisible network that is like right there. And, and so many people don't even know about them. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I, and I think that's the thing for a lot of people that are trying to get around. They want convenience. Yep. They want efficiency. And, uh, You know, if you just, I think a lot of people that they're just trying to get to work, they're not going to be willing to do that unless it gets, you know, unless they make it easier, make it more efficient, make it feel, you know, feel safer. And the thing is, I think that's, you know, I've used the subways, I've used the trains a lot in Los Angeles, and uh, they're they're pretty good. You know, they need to run much more regularly to be useful. There's plenty of times where I was you know, out late and the train just stopped running and we had to try to catch like, you know, three buses to get to where we need to go. And, you know, depending on your sense of adventure, that may not be that fun for somebody at, you know, two in the morning. Right. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Well, to to your, to your point though, like say you've got kids with you and you, you can't have, when you look at behavior modification and when you're looking at trying to establish uh, new patterns of mobility, you can't all of a sudden just start throwing a whole bunch of friction at people. Like you said, sure. it has to be as easy as that habit of just reaching for the car keys, jumping in and doing it and doing it mindlessly, even though that exactly. trip might have been inherently walkable or bikeable and from a distance sure. perspective. But if it's not enjoyable, if there's a lot of friction there, if it doesn't feel safe, that's one of the biggest challenges. Sure. And I, I think there's so many, based on my experience and where the places that I've lived in Los Angeles, there's lots of very dangerous roads, very thin sidewalks, a lot of sidewalks that are obstructed. There's been this one sidewalk right by my house that's been obstructed for about 10 years. Mm-hmm. You know, I call about, I call LA Department of Transportation 311 all the time and they, they you know, eventually the homeowner will clean up, clean up the shrubs and mm-hmm. you can actually walk, walk through there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's there's plenty of 
no areas without curb cuts. You, you actually bring up a really good point though, right there of what you just said. What's that? Is, is that the way that um, many cities in North America approach the public realm, the right of way, is they shift the sidewalk over to the responsibility of the property owner, mm-hmm. which when you really think of it, it, we don't do that for motor vehicles. Correct. <laughs> I yep. mean, it's just, it's asinine that we shift that responsibility of the right of way of the public realm to the homeowner to, to have to do that. You know, exactly. It doesn't even it, take into consideration whether the homeowner has the ability to do that. Well, and I, I for this particular house, I'm not I don't even think they do. You know, I yeah. believe there are older folks that live there. I can't act, they have a big wall, so I can't actually like ring their doorbell or anything. Yeah. But yeah, it is it is one of those things where I'm not sure they can take care of it. Yeah. And they shouldn't they shouldn't yeah. have to. Yeah. You know? Well, we I see mean, the same thing in, in snowy environments, too. Yeah. So yes, that's you, true. you go into a, a you know, a, a city, you know, I'm familiar with Boulder, Colorado, because I lived there for a decade and, and mm-hmm. it was the responsibility of the homeowner to make sure that you shoveled the sidewalk so that, you know, people walking on the sidewalk didn't trample it down and then start to create black ice, you know, icy conditions sure. on the sidewalk. And so that responsibility, again, got shifted over to the, you know, the, the homeowner. It's not the homeowner's responsibility to, to, to plow the street. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah and, and it's, it's frustrating because, you know, like we talked about the mobility plan that Los Angeles is not following. Yeah. Um, you know, there's this big problem with these very dangerous roads, very, very tough to cycle safely. I mean, I, I generally, if I'm biking, I'll just ride on the sidewalk. Mm-hmm. You know, I know that in a lot of, in, in, Los Angeles, I believe it's mostly legal unless you're in unincorporated areas and it's not. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just, it's safer. You know, obviously if there's pedestrians, I'll walk the bike or go, or, you know, or to go around them. But, sure. but, uh, but, you know, it's, there's very, there are some, there is some infrastructure that is popping up and Los Angeles is, is trying, you know, they're trying to do it, but they're also making some really terrible mistakes. You know, in my neighborhood, one of the more car dependent areas of Los Angeles that I know of, they remove, they have removed three sidewalks and one of them was a school crossing. Hmm. Wow. And basically they just, they put up a sign for a few days to saying, if you have a comment on this sidewalk, uh, or this crosswalk, uh, let us know. And, you know, not many people comment because nobody in their right mind would cross there because it's so dangerous. So there's, 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 it's, they're saying there's a lack of demand, but it's right. really just a lack of safety. There's plenty of people that would cross there. I would right. cross there if it was safe. So it's, well, it's, I'll, I'll give have, you a funny uh, a joke slash analogy to, to, to this, and then we'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll turn this over to you for the last word. Sure. The, the joke that we use is like, you know, well, well, should we be, you know, building this, you know, uh, bike and pedestrian bridge across the river here? And it's like, well, you know, there's just no demand. We don't see anybody swimming <laughs> across the river, you know, with their bikes. Yeah. I and mean, it's like, exactly. It, it, you don't do this because there's a demonstrated demand. You do this because it's the right thing to do. We look at it from uh, an equitable perspective. You look at it from uh, a perspective from the lens of, of just the, the, you know, the environment, what we need to be doing, uh, is the right thing to do. Is it, is it the right thing to do? So, yeah. And, and I, I do think that part of my job moving forward, I think is going to try to appeal to towards the self-centered nature of people that feel like they need a car and feel like they deserve to have a car. They deserve to be able to get to where they want to go, uh, quickly is, is to, you know, try to talk to those people about, you know what, if you actually were in favor of bike lanes, if you were in favor of uh, bus lanes and shifting people, shifting a small percentage of those people to other modes, it's going to be better for you. It's going to be a better experience. It's going to be more yeah. pleasant. There's going to be less traffic. Fewer people are going to die. Which is exactly um, I, the experience that we talked about that's happening in the ne- Netherlands. Yes. You know, the highest I, I uh, think, rated uh, uh, satisfaction level of motor vehicle drivers. So Yes. And I... And I, I, I do believe that we need to, there needs to be a discussion with car owners. And that's what I'm, what I, what I think I'm going to try to do is discussion with car owners, a discussion with people who, you know, car buyers, a discussion with, you know, car enthusiasts about how can we make this experience that often sucks less right. sucky, <laughs> you know? Well um, said. I, <laughs> yeah, yes. My, 
my lovely vocabulary. No, <laughs> I, I, I think it's great. I mean, it's uh, it, it's it's the it's the same sort of uh, approach that Jason Slaughter uses uh, with the, the not just bikes uh, channel. Mm-hmm. You know, just calls it out and says, no, this this sucks. <laughs> This yeah. is not the way to go about, you know, creating a community. And uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, being able to just have small little shifts in the number of people who are driving has a tremendous impact on uh, the congestion levels and the and the uh, gridlock conditions that can exist and, and can pop up in a moment's notice. Um, and so it's not like it's not like you're you're saying to people, no, you can't drive. It's like. No, I mean, seriously, when we are supportive of mobility systems and choice in mobility options, um, it's better for everybody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's that's a that's a much more eloquent way of saying that I want to make things le- less less sucky. sucky. <laughs> <laughs> Ethan, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast, and thank you so much for doing what you're doing. It's incredibly important, and uh, please know uh, we're noticing it's powerful. And keep it up. I appreciate you having me on, and I, I enjoyed our talk. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Ethan Tufts of Hello Road. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up. <laughs> Leave a comment down below and uh, share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, just hit the subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell right next to it so you can select your notification preferences. I'll be back next week with another episode. Uh, so until then, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Also sending out a very big thank you to all my amazing Active Towns ambassadors who are directly supporting my efforts through Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, the YouTube Super Chats and Super Thanks, as well as buying things from the Active Towns store and making donations to the nonprofit. Every little bit helps and is greatly appreciated. Thank you all so very much.